that are blocked off. They are not safe for us to go into. Otherwise, we would have everybody down there. But I think that kind of covers everything that we do. So thank you. Glad Jen would ask about the fallout shelter. Is it still? Yeah. Oh, she doesn't even know about a fallout shelter. <laughs> that shows you how young she is. <laughs> In them? <laughs> <laughs> Have you found any? Not yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> Are you worried? <laughs> <laughs> this one ain't mine. <laughs> Thank you, Malcolm. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm Jane Moore, and I'm the president of Sumner County Historical and Genealogical Society. And Valerie mentioned that our research room is in the front hallway down to the south end, and that and. We do a lot of family research, town research, building research, whatever somebody asks us to do. And then we have a lot of, um, a huge collection of yeah, obituaries, newspaper clippings, family histories, things like that, yearbooks and, and things that pertain to Sumner County and that. So, we have researchers who come in from out of town. We have researchers who contact us by phone or through the email. And, that, and um, we try and do the best we can to help them out. And that we are, we've done a lot of projects here in, in Wellington. We uh, worked on the Pioneer Cemetery, which was still an ongoing project. We have some work still to do out there with the gravestones and things and that we're working now to do a postcard book of the county and we're collecting postcards and that we have quite a few so now we have to get get ready and do the critiquing on each of the cards and that and get them laid out so we can get a book printed and things and lots of stuff like that we thank jim for coming tonight he's He's a good speaker. We have Jim speak about a lot of things here in Wellington. He seems to know the town pretty well. And that the uh, center is open on Tuesdays from 10 to 4 or by appointment. And then so you can contact us. And I believe the contact information is in your program that you hopefully you picked up out down there and everything. So um, if you didn't sign in, there's a sign in sheet back there at the sign in table. And then um, Helen is back there and she'll show you where it's at. And I'm going to turn this over to Sherry and she can introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Jane. I, I'm, I'm Sherry Klein and I'm the Vice President of the Stumbler County Historical and Genealogical Society. And um, so thank you all for coming. Um, Besides, and Jane's kind of already said some of what I wrote down here, but besides his day job, uh, Jim Bales is also the director of the Chisholm Trail Museum, and he's very, very knowledgeable about early and summer county history, and he does great presentations. He's also bailed us out a few times at the last minute when someone had to cancel for a death of family and other things. He and the other museum volunteers, they just do a wonderful job of sharing Sumner County history and preserving it. And uh, several of Jim's programs can be found on the Sumner County Historical and Genealogical Society's YouTube page. Not all of his presentations are out there yet, but several are. So just go to youtube.com and do a search for SDHTS. We want to thank Jim for 
not only agreeing to speak tonight, but for bailing us out several times in the past. Please welcome Jim Bales. I know nothing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so first off, let me tell, tell you that I am just an amateur historian. I was born and raised here in Wellington, so I'm a native, and so this is just a hobby for me. So if I get a few things wrong, don't hold it against me. Uh, and, and I do it mostly to promote the museum. Uh, we've been involved in the museum the uh, last uh, 10, 12 years, my wife and I. Uh, man, there's so much treasures in this town, museum, this building, uh, some of the other uh, locations. That, uh, it's just worth talking about, so uh, I like to do them. So. Uh, but tonight, we're here to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of this building. This is a wonderful, wonderful building. I can't believe, uh, from all the research I've done, that we've been able to keep it uh, alive and going for those hundred years, not because the building wasn't sound enough, but uh, just things change over time. But it, I mean, it's a solid building. You guys did the tour through it. Uh, you know, they say it's dangerous to walk in the tunnels, but I was in there. I wasn't worried at all. So. Anyway, uh, the building was uh, built hundred years ago before I start talking about the building, I want to talk about the time frame and the mentality of everybody in that time frame uh, and kind of how we got to, uh, to where it's at. So after the Civil War, um, during the Civil War actually, a lot of Confederate uh, families were going to visit their, uh, where their family had fallen and would uh, memorialize the grave sites. And so after the Civil War, uh, the veterans uh, would get together in loose organizations and kind of uh, help each other out. They were kind of like their own sport groups. Uh, but there was a surgeon, he was an uh, ex-war surgeon um, by the name of Dr. Benjamin Franklin Stevenson. <coughs> and he saw the need for, uh, what did I do? my microphone. Saw the need to help uh, veterans and the disabled and the families of, of the uh, fallen soldiers. So he got these loose groups organized and, and formed the Grand Army of the Republic. And not only did it help uh, a lot of the veterans just mentally, uh, they also became a very powerful political force and passed lots of legislation that got uh, veterans uh, pensions and medical help and uh, pensions that helped the families even on the uh, fallen soldiers. So this became quite a thing. Then when we went to war with the, uh, the Spanish in uh, 18, uh, 98 or whatever, uh, the, after that the war, because these veterans fought on foreign soils, they organized their own little group that, to help their veterans, and that was called Veterans of Foreign Wars. And they, basically the, uh, the background was the same, they were trying to help their veterans and their disabled to uh, cope with uh, their injuries after the war. So in comes the uh, World War I, and of course another organization is formed uh, in March uh, 15, 1919 uh, by the American Expeditionary Forces who are still actually over uh, in uh, France. They hadn't all come home yet, the war was over, but they still hadn't come home yet, and they went ahead and organized the American Legion. And here's a picture of that uh, caucus when they performed in 1919. There's a lot, probably 200 some people there. Uh, but they organized and they organized the left. And World War I, of course, was such a different war because it was a massive call to arms. Now, no other war in the history of the world ever had that many people uh, involved. Um, you know, to think some of the numbers, the German, uh, Germans lost two million soldiers were killed in that war. Uh, the French lost, uh, I think, 1.3 million or something like that. British 760,000. We by uh, we're just we just lost 170 compared to those numbers. We're, we're not, not much. But then we got in late. We got in fast. We went in there with the right attitude. Get in there, get the job done, get home. So uh, with that kind of attitude, the, the war was over. Prior to the war, we were trying to get into the war. Uh, we did things a lot different than we do nowadays. The, the war was fought by National Guard troops. And a lot of those National Guard troops started organizing in their local communities. Here in Sumner County, 
uh, the National Guard group that was here had already started drilling and practicing and learning their uh, skills out in the field and out, outside of town. And then they were uh, lined up with the 35th Division, uh, which was organized down in Camp Donovan in Oklahoma. And most of the troops came from Kansas, Missouri, uh, and, and some in Oklahoma. The thing about World War I was, was because it was structured that way, so if you recruited all the boys in Summer County to Camp Donovan, why, they all stayed together. They all stayed in the same unit with Company L of the 35th Division. And so they all stayed together, lived together, partied together, fought together. So, you, you know, if one of them died, it affected the whole group. If the, all of them died, it affected the whole community. So it was uh, not, not really a good thing. But the 35th Division went over to France and they fought in the uh, the Meuse Argonne Offensive, I hope I said that right, I'm not French, so, uh, which was the largest offensive of the war. It only lasted 47 days, and it, uh, had, it encompassed 1.2 million American soldiers to fight that offensive. But they fought from when they started in September to the, the signing of the armistice on November 11th. So they were in there, got the job done, and they got out. Uh, here's um, headlines from the Wellington Daily. Uh, November 11th, uh, pretty interesting read actually, you can pull it up sometime and read it up. So during this time, there was uh, unprecedented need for, for society to commemorate and memorialize the, everyone. In France alone, there was 100, over 170,000 memorials erected uh, in the last the five years after the war. Uh, Jack Pershing, John, uh, General John Pershing, had to go over there and put a limit on what kind of memorials could be set up and uh, how much money and where they were at, that kind of thing. He actually had to cut them back. So families would, they might lose two or three of their sons and, because they all stayed together in, in a certain battle. So they would go over and spend their money because they wanted to put up some memorial to their, their children, which makes sense, but uh, it got kind of out of hand. But that sense of patriotism and trying to memorialize the dead uh, carried over here in Wellington as well. And a lot of other communities were uh, coming up with uh, memorials for their fallen soldiers. Wellington decided that they wanted something a little more practical. And I think the city council uh, might have been uh, thinking about this prior to, and this just gave them a good reason to uh, forge ahead. So uh, some of the city commission and some of the commercial club, which became the Chamber of Commerce, got together and uh, went on a, a little train ride, and they went down to several communities. This is a picture of uh, uh, Hayes uh, Auditorium, which was built in 1913. They went to Hayes, Topeka, uh, Salina, and I think, well, Salina they went later, uh, and Kansas City. And they looked at auditoriums all those places uh, looking for ideas to come up with their auditorium to commemorate the, the soldiers. And then when they ended up in Kansas City, they talked to an architect by the name of Carl Bowler, and uh, he got on board right away, and I mean within a week, he came down to Wellington with plans in hand of what our uh, memorial auditorium should look like. Now this is a picture uh, of those plans, but it, if you notice, it looks quite a bit different than what we ended up with. Um, it was to be 196 feet long and 116 feet wide. Uh, it was to seat 3,000 people. Um, there was quite a few accoutrements. Um, the seating arrangement, not much different than what we have here today, but uh, probably just a little more seating and less than the balcony was a little bit different. Stage was very similar to what we got today. Um, and this is uh, the ground floor. It's very similar to what we got here today with the uh, layout. And then the portion of notice right up in the front corner uh, on each side are the bathrooms. You can't really see it very well there because, but those were the toilet stalls on each side, ladies, men's. So we brought those plans down. Uh, the city and the commercial club liked them. Uh, they had an order that they had a meeting and they had to put up for, oh, the, the, 
the uh, architect also came with an estimate to how much to build this, and his estimate was $140,000. So uh, this, the commercial club went to the city, put a petition for uh, the city to raise the mon the money to pay for this building. Uh, some of those people that were on that commission, uh, or committee, were people like E.M. Carr, which would have been uh, David Carr's grandfather, uh, Ellis Carr, um, W.H. Burke, who was a banker, uh, actually he was the uh, manager and founded the Security State Bank. And let's see, there was uh, Price House, who was, was another cashier at Wellington National Bank, which became First National Bank. And then there was uh, uh, another fellow, I can't think of the name right off hand, but he was a real estate agent. And so you, you can kind of get the idea that these people that are on the commission had a lot to do with money and power in Wellington. And then, of course, uh, on the uh, city side was um, was Joseph Rawls and uh, O.J. Hackney, uh, a couple other. Now, you got these names probably don't mean a lot to you guys, but I read about them in the paper all the time, and these names come up over the, for 20, 30 years. They keep coming up again and again, doing improvements and building things in, in Wellington. Uh, anyway, so they called, uh, they gave the petition, and they called for a vote, and they put that money up there, the $140,000 to get bonds, and uh, it, it passed. Uh, uh, it was signed by Mayor Joseph Rawls, who is another fascinating character in, in our history. Sometime I'm gonna do a presentation on him because he came to this county in 1871, uh, which was nothing, and uh, he became our sheriff. He was our sheriff for almost 10 years. He was our mayor for uh, almost that length of time as well. And then he also was had a colorful past in that, um, well, he went up to the Klondike to try to strike the rich with gold. And so interesting character, uh, but that's for the, a later day. Anyway, he signed the proclamation. Uh, the proclamation went to a vote. It, it was approved by the, uh, by the citizens. I think the vote was 1,200 to uh, 700. Anyway, it passed with the uh, flying colors, and uh, they put the bid out to for contractors to bid on the building. But the thing was that they didn't get any bids uh, when it came back. This is this is actually the second bid, uh, but you can see uh, this is April 20, 1920, and the contractors put out bid. It came in uh, fifty thousand dollars more than the hundred and forty, so like a hundred ninety thousand dollars. Now, to put that in perspective, $140,000 then was $2.4 billion today. So, uh, anyway, the, bid came in, the bids that did come in were $50,000 over the $140,000 in bonds. So they let that, they tabled that, let it ride for a little bit. They took the plans back to the architect. He trimmed off some things, made the building a little bit smaller, and uh, put the bid out again. And the second time, they got no bids at all. Uh, what bids they did get were still $30,000 over. So they tabled that for almost a year. And finally, they trimmed the building again, went to the architect, made changes, and put the bid out again. Uh, that time, it was successful, and uh, the contract was let. Part of what happened was J.H. Mitchell was a contractor, a local contractor, and he won the general contracting at $100,000. $10,000, and a local plumber at uh, the Burks Plumbing got the plumbing bid for about $5,000, and then the electrical and some of the other stuff uh, got let out to Kansas City and Wichita companies. Um, I always wondered if Burke, Burks Plumbing was some relation to this W.H. Burks, who was on the commission that uh, got, the, uh, got everything rolling, but I never could find that, never could prove that. Anyway, it got uh, the bid got let out, and they started construction uh, November 15, 1921. Now keep that date in mind, because uh, that's kind of neat. Um, so by March 22nd of 1922, what's that? Four months later, they're uh, laying the cornerstone, and you guys have seen this picture. It sits out front of the building, and uh, seen it in various different places. Um, 
the Masons came and did the uh, cornerstone ceremony. That was a big thing back then. The veterans, the American Legion veterans, uh, they got together at their headquarters, wherever that was, and marched down in their uniforms in a parade down to this location. And uh, the Masons did the same thing. They came down in all their accoutrements. Let me see if I can blow that up a little bit because there's some interesting things. So, on this picture, you look at this dapper fellow in the top hat there in the corner with this Mason's apron on. His name was O. O. J. Wood, and he was the ex Grand Master of uh, Kansas Masonic Lodge, and he came down to officiate and do his uh, presentation speech. Now, that cornerstone setting right there, he was the person that uh, laid, uh, they put a copper box. Underneath the stone, before they, and the stone was hollowed out from this copper box. Inside that copper box was a Bible given by the ministers of the uh, town, a list of the uh, city commissioners, a list of the uh, committee members for the auditorium, a history of the auditorium, and a newspaper. So it's basically a time capsule. And to my knowledge, I'm sure it's still underneath that cornerstone uh, today. It was about the size of a little bit bigger than a brick. Um, anyway, he's looking pretty dapper there. This gentleman, uh, you know, this old fella, right? Well, I, I don't have my laser pointer, but it kind of been over there with white gloves on. His name was Mr. Michael, and he was from Wellington, and he was the oldest living member of the Masons at that time. He was 94 years old. And just looking at these old pictures at, at the people on their faces, the, the children. There are a few soldiers on stage with their little aprons, so they were not going to be the Masons as well as uh, veterans. And then, of course, a few veterans down here in this right hand lower corner in their uniforms. So it was a pretty big deal. And I'll get back on track here. So, construction started. One of the interesting things I found was that all the material came in, the building building came in on the railroad, and there were two uh, big draft horses called Ted and Prince. And Ted and Prince would haul all the material off of the railroad cars down here to in front of the building, and they would pile it up in the middle of the street. And then they would let they would let a path on each side of the material so people would drive their cars or the horse buggies on either side of the material. Now sometimes they had to close off one side because they would string a, a rope or a, a guide cable down there and just drive a stake in the middle of the street and then they'd have to flag off the street so people couldn't go through. But anyway, all the material was just stored right in the middle of the street as they used it. So Ted and Prince, these two big draft horses, one of them weighed uh, 1,520 pounds, and the other one weighed 1,500 pounds, so they were huge animals. Uh, they unloaded 110 carloads of materials to uh, the front of the building, and one load, they could carry 104 sacks of concrete. Well, that got me to thinking, so they're bringing this concrete in in sacks. I don't know how they mixed it, I don't know if it was mixed by hand, but if you've ever looked at this building, there was so much concrete in this building, I don't know how you would build it today, but lots of concrete. Anyway, these two horses carried it all here. Uh, another interesting, uh, I didn't talk about the company that had the heating contract, but uh, <coughs> down in the basement in the park that you guys can't go to, uh, there are, the heaters are still there. Uh, they were originally coal heaters, and they were changed to gas heaters probably in the 30s. Um, but the heaters there and the coal chutes are still there. Uh, two big heaters. They had two huge fans. One, uh, this six-foot fan, thanks to Kevin Dodge for being my perspective poser. Uh, big squirrel picket, and that sets right behind those two furnaces that you looked at. So as they shovel the coal in, the heat somehow would come up through this squirrel cave and then be blown into tunnels under the building. And uh, there was a six, a seven foot fan in the basement that would blow it from that end of the building to that end of the building, and then it would shoot uh, out these uh, two big vents on each side. 
and uh, keep the building. There was also a, a six foot fan in the ceiling above the stage, so in the summertime, they would kick these fans on without the furnace, and the fan in the ceiling would just exchange air, and they could exchange the air so fast that it kept it fairly cool. Again, good job, Kevin. So the building was getting during completion, uh, and while this postcard, or this picture here says completed, in 1922, October 1922. It really wasn't completed until, until about November 14th. Uh, after the, they were trying to get done before the, uh, the Memorial Day, November 11th, day, but they just couldn't quite get it done. So uh, it was finally uh, presented to the city and dedicated on November 19th of 1922. And uh, they had a big, uh, big presentation ceremony, uh, the chorus of 100 voices, so the school uh, schools in the community got all the kids together and they sang uh, this 100 voice choir, which I'm not sure where they put them at. Uh, this building was supposed to only seat 2,500, but they say there were 3,500 people here that night. Uh, and they had to go borrow seats from the uh, Presbyterian Church and one of the other churches to bring in here for extra seating. The uh, presentation speech was given by uh, Dr. Kurtz. He was president of McPherson College at the time. Uh, according to the newspaper articles, he was quite the orator. They have a, one of the newspapers uh, have the, his complete speech in there. And it is uh, quite inspiring. Uh, and here's a picture of him and his wife. Uh, this was taken in 1909, so it's only a what, 12 years before the, the presentation. So he, he was a pretty young guy. I'm going to say he's 25 in this picture. So he must have been in his early 30s when he came here to, to speak and, and give the presentation speech. Um, the interesting thing about this is he was born in Germany. And he came here as a lad, grew up here. But he, during the war, he uh, traveled around speaking and promoting and selling war bonds to fight the Germans. And, I don't know, there's some dichotomy there. Born in Germany, but making sure that they didn't win. Um, anyway, the program for the night, I uh, can't read that very well, but opening the building for inspections at uh, 6 o'clock so people could tour like they could tonight. They could walk around uh, the whole building and see what there was to see. At 7 o'clock, uh, the band started playing music. Uh, at 7.30, W.H. Burks, that uh, cashier that I was talking about. He was the master of cer ceremonies and they had a few speaking things. And they, they, they sang the uh, chorus of 100 voices sang uh, America and then there were a few talks by the uh, commissioners um, and then a prayer and then Mr. Uh, the dedication speech by uh, President Webster and then they finished out the night with a couple of songs. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was the stage had uh, six drop-down curtains, and of the six, the first one had a picture of the Statue of Liberty. And here's a, the only picture I can find of that. Uh, That's nice. And it's not a very good picture, but uh, they say it was a gorgeous, beautiful color scene of uh, the Statue of Liberty uh, in the harbor. And then the other stage, or the other curtains, there was an oleo, which oleo, you know, was advertising and uh, stuff like that. And then there was a wood scene, a garden scene, maybe a mountain scene, uh, and then, uh, but there were six different scenes in each one. So the ending of the night, they would drop these curtains down and play music to kind of correspond, kind of like a slideshow kind of thing. Uh, but they all said it was very breathtaking and very fascinating. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that the Memorial Auditorium was always intended uh, for the veterans, of course, and the American Legion was given uh, the room that the, veteran, that the uh, veterans' uh, equipment is in now as their clubhouse, and so they took it over that night, and that became their headquarters, I suppose. Uh, 
for several years until they kind of outgrew it and then moved to their present location. But I thought that was fitting when I found that out that veterans room was still being used for veterans in the morning. Um, so the building's finished. Um, big goop to do. I found this picture about the same time frame looking at the cars. I'm going to guess those are about 1920 cars. I'm not a car expert, so I can't tell, but that's kind of what it, it actually looked like right next to City Hall. Um, and, and of course, the newspapers uh, stating that the Memorial Hall is dedicated uh, November 1922. So then after that, the hall was used, I mean, like the next weekend, I think the veterans put on a show. I can't remember what the name of the show was. It sounded kind of racy, actually. Uh, but. It, it, they put on a show the very next weekend. They hired a, a theater group to come in, and there are several theater groups that came through almost every weekend for a while. So it was like an opera house in a way. Uh, um, this was the uh, Denishaw dancers. Well, it, you know, from a distance you can't see it, but that these were very popular at the time. They were uh, toured all over the United States, and I think they were from Arkansas. But I'm not sure. Anyway, this Ruth St. Dennis and this Ted Shaw. And, put together their group and they called themselves the Denishon Dancers. Now they came through, did their program, and donated most of their proceeds to the Memorial Auditorium. So uh, to fund, I think that that's when they put installation, we were looking at this earlier, that picture here of the building, you'll notice the open girders, you can almost see the roofing uh, material from the bottom side uh, up there. And their money was to go to help the acoustics of the building. And I'll show you another uh, inside shot where it kind of looks. Um, here's another program that they put on the woman of it. Uh, that was 1923. Um, and then besides the acoustics that were, the panels that were put up, they're also, uh, they had what they call a radio phone. And I think that the radio phone had to do with the projector because the projector booth was put in and I think they were planning on doing movies and such. But I also wonder, they said there were two towers out on the southwest side that had to do with the radio phone. So I don't know what the radio phone was, whether that was a, a wireless radio or what. But I'll have to do more research on that. But anyway, they did have the projection booth, which did, they were doing talkies by that time. But they didn't have a PA system. So in 1926, they, the commercial club, got the money together to put in uh, a PA system. And this, I'm thinking this picture is circa 1928 or 29. And if you look in the far right corner on top of the air system there, you'll see that big speaker. And if you could zoom in, let me see if I can do that. Zoom in on this picture. You'll see that that big that horn up there on top. And if you get close enough, you probably can't see it from the screen. But those people are standing in front of a microphone, the kind that's big hoop circle, and the center part is suspended in springs. Um, so they're doing some kind of a PA press. So definitely uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. This was probably a trade show. Uh, some of the there's Riley Jewelry, uh, Ray, Ray Studio, and uh, the Democrats were there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but pretty fascinating photograph. Uh, oh, and this is the other thing I wanted to show you. Look in the ceiling now, up at the top, you'll see the panels uh, that they put in place to, to try to help with the acoustics. several events, too numerous to mention. If you go through the newspapers, there's, there's just stuff happening every weekend, it seemed like here, uh, big events. But uh, one that Sherry reminded me of that I thought I'd better include was the pageant that happened here in 1941. So that was Wellington's 75th. 75th, I think. No, 70th. 70th. 
Um, and, and Dorothy Day, bless her soul, and uh, several others wrote a pageant that they put on. Now, there was a pageant put on in 1921 for the golden anniversary. Uh, they have that down at Selfish Park, and that was quite a production. So she wrote this pageant, and it basically went through the history of Wellington and Sumner County, uh, and it, it was quite a production. Uh, it was the map that she put together showing Sumner County and the Chisholm Trail, and uh, it says down at the bottom, 70 years of history passes in review. And uh, so she tried to take vignettes of every little part of Sumner County history and put in this play. The play is online. Pageant. The script is online. The script is online. Where's that at? Oh, through the library. And you can read it. Uh, there's two scripts on there. I mean, one's like her, like her personal script that she used to direct people with, and the other one was what she wrote to kind of uh, give it all the context. I think one's kind of like a program, and one's actual script with her, her own handwriting. So it has her own notes and stuff like that. Uh, and it's pretty fascinating. Uh, some of it's great history for some account. If you get a chance, you get online and look for it. Uh, the, the thing that uh, got me was how much of a production this, this thing was. They said they had 2,500 people. It was a packed night. Uh, they came to view it. And yet they also had, uh, here's uh, the actors. There's, uh, let's see, there's 60 actors in that second, uh, the bottom group. Top group of people are students that came to that participated in. The bottom group are just actors or locals that, that uh, portrayed actors, and there's 60 people there. So the logistics of putting a production together like that, you, you just can't believe. On top of that, was it 450 kids? I was gonna say 600. 600 kids that they brought from the schools to make up the choir. Now, where they put all those people, and then the, the audience just boggles my mind. Now, one other fact that I couldn't find any information, but that's because of the newspapers, and, and I ran out of time, was that during the war, this, this uh, presentation was put on in 1941 for that pageant. But Ted Davis told me once that uh, the Memorial Auditorium during the war, they built airplane parts in here. They had machines moved in here in the lower part. And there was a couple of buildings across the street that they had machines, I think, through Clark Manufacturing, but I'm not positive about that. But he, he was part of that before he went off to war. And he said they had machines set up all around, the, down the basement, they were making airplane parts uh, through, through the war. So that would be a fascinating part of the research. Anyway, uh, I didn't find any pictures at that time. Uh, they did have uh, several events afterwards. This is the Golden Globes and Gloves that they had uh, for several years. Uh, one, of the, one of the, and it was a big deal. It threw a lot of people. Uh, there's some pictures from that event. Um, and this is, you can see this show sort of look. These guys are pretty motley looking. They've got scars on their faces and bandages and loose uh, missing teeth and the whole nine yards. But uh, I was a kid in the early 60s and for some of you from here did. I remember coming to all-star wrestling matches that they had in here and watching like Nature Boy Williams throw his golden body pins out to the crowd and stuff like that. So, uh, but the kind of events started getting uh, weaker and weaker. Um, and by 1968, why there was a question as to whether they would, we should keep it or not. Um, they were actually talking about it. The mayor of the time was Matt McGuire. And I guess right, uh, Matt, it was Mr. Dwyer. And he was actually in favor of tearing it down. And so this question came up with the city council because of the upkeep. Uh, it was costing, uh, let's see, $5,000 a year or something to just sweep and uh, keep the doors and the light bulbs up. And uh, they didn't think that was an expense the city needed. They were still having events in here. Uh, they had, uh, well, there's another slide I have here that had Scream of Rama, I think, or something like in 1971 or two. Uh, but they still had some events in here, but the building was leaking, the roof was leaking, and it was in bad shape. Uh, and so, you know, it, it came up several times with the city council meetings, and there was quite a few uh, colorful discussions, uh, whether to keep it or tear it down. Um, I think probably, let's say it probably cost too much to tear it down. Uh, 
And in 1971, if some of you from here remember that blizzard that hit, uh, I don't know, I remember it, uh, there were over 500 cars stalled between Wichita and uh, the state line and on the turnpike, and I don't know how many on 81, but a lot of travelers were stranded, and uh, so the museum got used, a museum, the Memorial Lodge Park got used as a uh, uh, safe haven, and I think they still have the civil defense uh, cots down in the basement, some of that stuff got used. Uh, Red Cross, there were still Red Cross uh, materials down there as well. Uh, so it was a good thing that it was here and they used it, kept these people warm and toasty for I think that was three days before we dug out of that one. I know I didn't go very far. Um, but here's 76, and this little article talks uh, Chief Neil Young from the fire department says it's a dangerous fire trap. Uh, they actually had this screamorama. Event, and there was water and power cables going through the water and they had to shut down the event long enough to get the electricians down here and move the, the water, the cables and stuff. And so he's saying it's a dangerous trap and it should be shut down and not be used for anything. Well, and Mr. Dwyer was on board with that because he was trying to promote tearing it down. Uh, but, thank goodness, the next election, why uh, Gordon Tackett, uh, one of the farmers here in town, he ran for mayor, and his main sales pitch was that he did not want to tear down the Memorial Auditorium. He wanted to keep it and figure out how to renovate it and fix it up. And he won uh, by a pretty good margin. And so he followed through with his campaign promises, and they put together a committee to research how much it was going to cost to renovate the building. So I've got to get my numbers right here, but I think he said $625,000 to hire an architect architect come in, did an assessment, told them it was going to cost $625,000 to, to renovate it, bring it up to standards, and uh, fix the roof, all that kind of stuff. So uh, they passed, just like before, they passed the bond issue and ran and got the $625,000. However, when they went to try to get it uh, contracted done, it came back at $900,000 bid to fix the building. Well, that sent the commission into a spin and they didn't know what the heck to do then um, so they, uh, they basically tabled it for a while trying to figure it out and they talked about several things at that time the city uh, hall was getting ready to be torn down uh, uh, yeah uh, i trying to remember when they tore that down it was 70 74 76 uh, anyway they were getting ready to tear it down because it was falling down and so they were talking about either building a new city hall or maybe combining and bringing city hall in here and using it for kind of dual purpose. But that went sideways too. Um, I don't remember what the reason was, but uh, they ended up not uh, combining the two. And uh, by the time they got it all figured, I mean, I mean, this was some heated discussions at the city council, the newspaper is full of all the drama, like we have drama today, uh, with the city council over this. Uh, there was one faction that wanted to use it for the city hall, and one faction that wanted to keep it as a memorial for the troops. Uh, and what eventually happened, uh, this was an article talking about the two sides and the two factions working. Uh, they had a vote for it to, when they had to vote for the, the bond issue, it passed like 1,200 to 600 votes or something, a big margin. But when they went back for this $300,000 extra to fix it up, it lost by 30 votes. So uh, then, then they, again, they're in quantity. Okay, so we have the bonds from the first issue, but we don't have enough money to fix it up or fix it right, so what do we do? And uh, luckily, uh, the fellow that really kind of saved the day was Lawrence Boker. He was involved and wanted to save the, him and Dr. Kobe wanted to save the, the building. And uh, what they found was they had that $625,000 sitting there, and it was drawing, not only drawing interest, it was also, there was some kind of payment schedule that, so it was drawing like $30,000 a year on top of that. And so by the time they decided whether they were definitely going to tear it down or not, the money sat there and, and accumulated to about $800 and some thousand dollars. So they had enough money to fix it. So, in the end, uh, that's what they did. They renovated the building. Uh, ceiling tiles that you see here today, that come from that renovation. Um, yeah, the floor, I think they put this concrete floor in there too. 
uh, as well. Um, so thank goodness, took an accountant to figure it out. Uh, anyway, it, this is uh, the two of them sitting in front of the, uh, the new stage. I don't know if you can tell any difference really, but it's like it does today, really. Um, and then hired a guy to run it. This is the manager they had at the time, Mr. Steve Heath. And he immediately started having uh, concerts in here again. And the very first concert that I had was the Jack Daniels Silver Concert Band. So I thought that was fitting. And that whiskey band to play. But they had very uh, elite uh, theater groups that come in here. The Tulsa Ballet came to play. The Kansas City Ballet came in and uh, did a performance down here. Uh, I remember this next one, the Up With People thing was big. My mother was big on that, so I think she made me go. But, uh, you know, it was a singing thing. It was, it was well attended, I remember. But the biggest thing of all, of course, uh, even today, as far as I'm concerned, it was Ruth McIntyre who played here in 1986. Uh, her and her brother, of course, they were on the upswing, so luckily they came here and, and played. And, and they were, they sat and uh, signed autographs and were uh, very personable people and they really enjoyed their, their time here. Well, according to the newspaper articles, I never talked to them, so can't say. Now that's up to 1986. I didn't take it any farther than that, mostly because I ran out of time, and I just didn't know that it was all that necessary. Uh, it's been through a couple more renovations since 1986, but uh, nothing as major as that or as could have been catastrophic had they torn the building down. But uh, it, it's a wonderful building. It served Wellington well. I hope it served Wellington well in other years. I think it can stand physically in the stand in another hundred years. But we're going to have to tweak it every so often, kind of like with the air conditioning system. It's, it needs to be updated every so often. So, anyway, that's where I'll leave you at today. If you have questions, I'll answer what I can. So just out of curiosity, when you showed the original uh, architecture drawings, it was the Liberty Memorial Auditorium? That's, that's what the original name was supposed to be, Liberty Memorial Hall. But uh, somewhere along the line, it got changed to Memorial Auditorium. Before they started building them, because most of the uh, newspaper articles after that, after they started construction, it was always Memorial Auditorium. A lot of them saw a municipal auditorium, but didn't really, really uh, If it was, I think that did you think you saw that in there? Yeah. Uh, I think probably, I, you, you can't believe some, you know, I thought the spelling and grammar was bad today. Uh, <laughs> Bowler was pronounced, was spelled baller, and then, it, you know, there was a lot of screwy ones. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fun to go through those articles, but you have to take it all with some kind of a little different. Yep, Harlan, I saw that one. I was here with they, they played here. I didn't think go, so I wondered uh, if I was right or not. Yeah, yeah, they played here. And then they had several other of those kind of basketball teams that come through, but Harlan broke the book off for here once. It was somewhere around the mid-70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Early 70s, I would say. I don't believe I would have come. I, I, I seem to remember that. I was only like six, seven years old. Is that, Is that right? right? Seems like you know, did they have a donkey basketball game in here once too. Yeah. Seems like I remember that. Yes. That was funny. Yeah. Than that. I remember laughing my head off for that. Yeah, uh, the circus is in here. <laughs> they, uh, it, it was originally intended to have livestock shows in here. Uh, that was before they built it. But when they were planning it out, they were planning on having livestock shows in here as well. But then they put, when they put it, they decided rather they would couple with the high schools and use it for the sports events. So they put the basketball court in here and it had a wooden floor. So that kind of went out the window as far as the uh, livestock shows. But it had a nice, I think they said maple wood floor. Uh, but it, in 1926, they almost had to tear it back out because the termites had gotten into it. They got into this building and to the uh, library and eaten up some of the floor. If I remember right, William Weber wanted to demolish this and turn the old city building and everything into a rec center. Yeah, he wanted to build a big fancy complex, didn't he? Yeah. I wonder what that would cost. He claimed he'd saved the money to do it, but. <laughs> well, 
Thank goodness it didn't happen. That was, I think that was his demise. Yeah, I think you're right. I think after that, that was, uh, well, that was in during that same time frame that they did that renovation. Uh, no, that was a little later. That was later. Yeah. Reba McIntyre, J.P. Buellsville was the manager at that time. So, did that happen after? Yeah, I'm thinking it was later. His mother was kind of involved in that, too. Well, we came back here in 77, and uh, the old town hall was still there in 77. Yeah, okay, 77. So it wasn't long after that, 77, 78, when they tore it down. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Cole was big instrumental in saving it from William Weber's. <laughs> yeah, okay. Wrecking ball. So it might have been the same time frame. Then. There's Dr. Cole and, and Lawrence Pope, right? And, uh, yeah, do you remember Dr. Cole? Well, Dr. Cole? Cole was involved in this probably from that time frame to, gosh, 2000 or something like that. Yeah. His service, his funeral service is right here in this building. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. His graduation? Oh yeah. I think so. Yeah, they had they had all the high school had their graduation ceremonies. They had their basketball games here for a while. Uh, because the junior high, well, well the junior high for me, but it wasn't high school. Uh, it was built in nineteen thirty three. Really didn't have a seating for any big games. So they would have their the high school would have their games here before uh, nineteen sixty four. That's when that uh, other high school was built. So most of our games had bus them over here for the big games because uh, it had to see. But I'm thinking that this basketball court's not quite uh, the same standard. I mean, the length of it's not. But the stage wasn't there then either, I think. Yeah, that's why it's a temporary stage. Yeah. It could be yeah, taken out. Of the length of the court. Yeah, yeah. yeah cause uh, one goal was mounted back there on the edge of the original stage. Well, there was one mound there, and there was one mound there yeah. that doorway there. Yeah, we used to have to fight those when we were doing community theater plays in here. Oh, yeah, because you'd have to fold them up or something, move them? Yeah. Unmold them from the floor or something? Well, did I put you on the sleep? <laughs> Very interesting, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? So just ask me. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, we had a question right here. Oh, yeah, yeah sir. Uh, I've got some information. My dad used to be a police officer here. Who was your dad? Darrell Robinson, Sr. And he was with the building over here. Yeah. It was a police station and fire station. Yeah. And he would talk about when they had the uh, all-star wrestlers. Yep. Yeah. Everybody was here. He said, "Boy, they was out for blood." Uh, he talked about one night after the show or the wrestling matches. He had to go work a wreck out west of town, and it was, you know, one of those big long buses. It was a big fender bender. But he said uh, he got there. All these wrestlers that was out for each other's blood, they was all on that same bus. <laughs> Fighting each other on the bus? No, they was they was buddies, they were brothers. Oh, I see. I see. But when they was here, boy, they, oh, yeah, I'm gonna rip your head off. But he said, I got out there, and here's all these guys, they's outside of the bus, and these were the wrestlers, and they was all traveling together in the same bus. Well, you know, they're all the wrestlers, they talking smack to each other. And that's when he said, yeah, their bus, the fender was bent down. He said, three of them grabbed a hold of the fender and ripped it up. And then went on their way. Went on their way. Over to Harper. Yeah. Another show or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say something briefly. I was here this weekend for our high school reunion. To have it here was pretty special. When I graduated in 82, the graduation was usually at the stadium. And Perry and Sherry, their daughter was in my class. It was over here because it was raining. And so having the reunion here was pretty cool. And I worked for Harold Branson a lot when I was a kid, and he was one of the, I don't know if he did the whole thing, but 
did a lot of the renovation here. And one of the biggest mm -hmm. treats was to go in those tunnels and uh, oh, yeah, explore a little bit. Yeah, didn't find any bodies down there. Harry wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> didn't find any. Never yeah, was. they did have uh, one of those spook investigations here about 10 or 20 years ago. I don't know. But I went to it, and the gal was telling me all, all about everything that happened in this building. And she was telling me about some girl that was killed over underneath in the tunnels, and her body was left there. Uh, I asked her, I said, well, I don't remember any newspaper article like that. Oh, it wasn't in the newspapers. So how do you know about this story? Well, I took pictures of this area, and I sent it to my medium who was out in California, and she looked at the pictures, and she told me the story. So it's kind of like all star wrestling. <laughs> but it makes a great story. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And I thank Becky and, and Valerie for helping with the organization of this tonight. We appreciate it very much. Thank you all for coming.